Hello, I'm Victor, and this is the Bookyard, right? Is that what I called it? Anyway, so I've read plenty of books over the years, some good, some bad, many so middle of the road they've fled my brain entirely. But what did they all have in common? I didn't feel the need to talk about any of them on my channel for over a decade. So why am I talking about David Weber's Off Armageddon Reef? Well, COVID-related boredom, obviously, but beyond that... This fairly serviceable book has a few bewilderingly distracting things about it that I couldn't help but overthink. So I'm inflicting my thoughts on you. Don't click off the video, you know you deserve this. But before we look at those thoughts, a quick synopsis. Aliens used the emanations from our technology to find us. They didn't like us. They didn't like anyone who wasn't them, in fact. They engaged in knee-jerk genocide against us. We were adapting quickly to their superior tech and simplistic tactics, but it was too little too late. A last safehold, named Safehold, was secretly established outside the aliens' immediate grasp to keep the last remnant of humanity alive. It needed to stay as undetectably low-tech as possible for as long as possible to allow us to come back with a fighting chance. But careful social and technological balances at such a long-term project would require call for a serious sacrifice. The remaining humans, all volunteers, were to have their minds wiped and reprogrammed to fit the grand plan without old baggage to throw potential wrenches in the works. Unfortunately, a movement among the higher-ups led to a new plan being adopted, to engineer a society on Safehold that never advances to tech high enough to be detected from the outside, and hope they aren't found by the aliens' slow but systematic expansion through known space. Instead of running to fight another day, humanity was going to hide for as long as it could. To do this, they fill the mind-wiped humans colonizing Safehold with the idea that they were just brought into being by God on this new world and presented a book of divine laws that would establish a formal church and, among other things, prevent them from adopting any technology beyond that of Earth's 18th century. They even plopped down a large central temple made from impervious future materials using low-energy climate control to act as proof of the divine's hand in their living world. To combat this dehumanizingly paternalistic and ultimately suicidal plan, but unable to muster the support to stop it from going into effect, a small resistance group squirrel away one of their number, their mind transferred into an inactive robot body in a buried cache of information and technology. 700 years later, with the original engineers of the current world likely dead, this living relic awakens to try to break humanity free of its ideological shackles and bring the human race back to a point where it may be able to finally defeat the enemy that nearly destroyed us. Wow, that recap of what amounts to the prologue took long enough. Now on to the actual review. It was okay, not really my thing. So now on to the real reason I made this. Assorted nitpicks. Okay, okay, I'm kidding. Kinda. See, my thoughts and feelings on the work are tied up in these nitpicks. So, yeah, let's pick nits. The thing that was really bothering me the entire book was the names. See, David Weber did have an interesting idea. To show the passage of centuries in a low-tech, limited literacy society, the spelling, pronunciation, and accents of the modern names the colonists started with got subtly warped over time, so all the characters have so-called normal names that you, the reader, have to take a second or two to even recognize. The problem? This book has dozens of characters, and there's this thing called narrative flow? I was not having fun having to stop every couple of paragraphs and quietly try to vocalize elaborately mangled names like... Henry Tyler, Henry Tellier, Jerome Vincent, Jerome Vincent, Travis Olson, Travis Olson, Jasper Mason, Jasper Mason, Melvin, Mulvain, and McPherson, McPherson. I mean, it's a clever idea, but not a good one, in my opinion. Like I said, it's distracting and breaks up the scenes with little word puzzles. And while it's got elements of good world building, like how places built up around the oldest settlements often have normally spelled names that reference Old Earth while later settlements get weirder, the effort ironically makes the world building seem more spotty. We know the people in charge of setting up Safehold were a diverse group, with suitably international names being dropped. But in order, I suspect, to make his name game even remotely practical, the author was stuck with familiar English names, like... Roger Macklin, Roger Macklin, Michael, Michael, Joseph, Joseph, Cody Niles, Cody Niles, Harold, Harald, and who could forget Queen Charlene, Charlene. No, really, how could you forget her? She's one of only two or three female characters to actually get dialogue. 
It's a medieval story focusing on the highest powers in the land, so I guess it makes sense to only focus on the male rulers and priests, and... Oh, wait, does it? Because it's not actually medieval, it's pseudo-medieval. This, again, was a society planned by a multicultural and multi... gendral group of intellectuals. Is this how they decided society had to run? Actually, Charlene existing as this exception implies that this is how society naturally shakes out, according to the author. If that's what he thinks, then that's what he thinks, but Weber's vision of this world is already excessively, Europeanly familiar. I feel that a setting with anachronistic gender equality and a crazy stew of mismatchingly diverse names would have had a little more flavor than, well, space Europe. Also, do you remember when I said only two or three female characters? That or wasn't my bad memory, it was ambiguity. See, that person who got put into the robot body was one Lieutenant Commander Nimue Albin. This body was a mechanical copy of her original meat body with extra features. One of those was the ability to change its appearance. Wanting to influence politics, she realized that she'd have to present as a male, so she constructed the persona of Merlin Othroas, an anatomically male holy man. And for the rest of the book, the narrator refers to Merlin by male pronouns, both when acting as Merlin and when alone with his thoughts. Now, this book was published in 2007, before there was that much really public discourse about trans issues, so I'm not hashtag canceling David Weber here, but this is again distracting to me. Nimue isn't disgusted by the idea of physical transition in the story, but it does imply that she finds it awkward and would prefer not to have to. And it's made clear in the narrative that Nimue slash Merlin still experiences sexual attraction to males, so the idea that the robot body renders one sexless doesn't hold up. Actually, can we talk about this robot body? The idea is that these bodies are essentially meant to be remote drones for hazardous work. Your mind is copied into it, it does a thing, and then the experiences are copied back into your meat brain and deleted from the body. They basically just jailbroke Nimue's bot to never delete her mind. So far, so good. Except, holy crap, what? These things are meant to be purpose-built for hazardous tasks with super strength, speed, balance, sensory equipment, communication equipment, and so on. But they are also, for some reason, perfect replicas of the individual owner with a fully customizable appearance and systems that allow the full emotional range, including sex drive? And all of this over-engineering ignores the fact that humanity can now basically become immortal machine minds, but decided to fight aliens by packing squishy meat beasts into tin cans and throwing them into the grinder. The mind-erasing-slash-transferring stuff in this book is so full of implications and questions, yet so comically underexplored. It basically served the story as a way for a whole people to not know their true origins, and for a character to be able to survive 700 years and then pass themselves off as a wizard. Though I should point out, I like the Arthurian lore they hid in there with Merlin. See, the leaders of the Resistance, and Nimue's parental figures, ended up being cast as the fallen angels in the mythology of Seyfold. So, like in some Arthurian stories, Merlin is again the offspring of the devil. Though I guess that again brings me to something distracting. The Safehold project got weird. All the people involved with the project would use high-tech in undetectable quantities to help the people of Safehold establish their society while masquerading as angels. And they used their actual names, so their holy book references specific individuals who are then worshipped as divine beings by the people. The guy who headed this particular direction for the project, Langhorn, is basically second only to God in the eyes of Safehold, and the people who oppose them are to be forever remembered as demonic beings, seemingly just to punish them. Now I presented the conflict of the Safehold project as being between people who wanted to fight and people who wanted to hide, because it is part of the narrative and makes sense, but the author presents it more as an ego thing. These guys wanted to hide humanity away, but they also really wanted to play God and be worshipped. That part is where the emphasis is placed, and it makes the story less grounded in service to making the situation humanity is in look even worse than it is. People forced to follow a fake religion to stunt their development? Not great, but arguably a necessary evil if you think humanity can't hope to win against the aliens. People forced to worship a snooty intellectual psychologist and his cronies because they all had god complexes? Less nuanced. The personalities of the founders have so little to do with the rest of the narrative that it comes across as a way to force investment in the conflict that lays at the heart of the story. Which I think can finally bring us to a close. Nothing I've said here so far is a spoiler for anything beyond the book's setup, but after this point I'm going to feel free to talk about other parts of the book, so be warned. Despite all my nitpicks and questions, this is a pretty decent read. It is, like I said, not my thing. It has a lot of politics and naval battles, and never really world-builds in that on-the-ground kind of way that I like, focusing solely on people who live in castles and temples. 
There's a theme of exploring how minor technological and systematic changes can have huge impacts, like how Merlin helps a progressive kingdom gain influence by essentially tweaking their existing boat and gun designs without actually breaking any rules of their religion. That's neat, though how much one can be invested by detailed descriptions of said advancements will differ from person to person. I'm probably pretty close to the target audience in that regard, and even I found it got a bit old. Another thing that struck me is that a lot of this book came across pretty distinctly as set up for future books in the series, of which there have been several. The aforementioned Queen Charlene had almost nothing to do with the narrative save to be set up as a potential wife for Prince Caleb, this story's King Arthur character. Merlin decides not to explore the main temple or the still-present orbital station to avoid the possibility of detection, which means we can expect outside agents to show up from there in future stories, and so on. But in the end, while I liked the book well enough as I read it, I don't find myself ready to dig into parts 2 through... 10? Cripes, I just looked this up online. 10 parts so far, and apparently some of the characters from the first book are old, but still alive? They still haven't technically broken any of the rules against technology? Yeah, 10 books of intimate politics and battles in a slowly industrializing world where science fiction tech only exists as a rarely used stand-in for magic is certainly something I can understand someone enjoying, but it is, again, not for me. Well, thanks for watching and have a good day. And if you're interested in picking up the book, the title again is Off Armageddon Reef by David Weber. And remember to subscribe to Jacques Brut. This has been Victor signing off.